you to ask questions after. I'm sorry. We'll okay, cool. We've started, so let's let's do this thing, and then we're we're going to be fine. It's going to be great. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Hildebrand, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for all the classes. This is our Space Week. So this is a really exciting time for us. It's our first ever Space Week. We've had astronauts, we've had engineers, amazing people in the space field, uh, over 30 hangouts this week. So uh, it's been very, very exciting. Right now we're joined by four classes from across North America. We might get a few more as, as time goes on, but I'll give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. So we've got Mrs. Essence, grade threes from Bakersfield, California. Woo! <laughs> yes, the enthusiasm was infectious. We've got Mrs. Ken Trells, uh, grade threes from Chicago, Illinois. <laughs> yes, the madness has been unleashed. Uh, we've got Miss Bifford's class from grade three class from Calgary. They can't actually yell because their mic isn't working, but we know they're enthusiastic. And then we've got Mrs. Kaiser's grade five from uh, sometimes. Sometimes. who are coming in in 10 minutes. Yeah, so we'll I get back to them in a second. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. We're joined live by Dr. Chuck Wynn of Northern Arizona University. He's had the fun and privilege to get to explore some of the world's most amazing places, be they the driest deserts in the world in Chile, uh, deep into volcanic pits in Hawaii, Easter Island, and more. You may wonder what that has to do with Space Week. Well, when you're exploring caves on Earth, NASA wants to work with you because they want to know how to explore caves elsewhere in the cosmos and elsewhere in the solar system. So without further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Wynn tell us a little bit more about that. And thank you so, so much for joining us, Jeff. Thank you so much, Jesse. Pleasure to be here. Hello, everybody. They won't be able to do that, but we, we, we'll, we'll wave at you. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into this. I'm going to do a screen share here first. Oh, let's see. All right. That worked. Excellent. Okay. All right, we're off to the races. Okay, so as Jesse mentioned, uh, I am a cave scientist, and I, my, my training is actually in ecology. That's what I did my PhD in, but over the course of the past 10 years, I've worked with NASA on a lot of different projects, and all of them were focused squarely on looking at cave exploration of Mars, specifically looking at how to find caves on Earth, and then using those techniques and technologies to look for caves on other planets. So as you can see here from the title of my talk, we're looking at cave exploration on Mars, and how do we get to that point to where we're actually able to either send robots into a cave, which is amazingly cool, or send humans into a cave. So first, why are caves important on Mars? And I think the easiest way for me to address that question, I have a two minute video that uh, NASA TV produced back in 2011. And what they were covering was this project that we had funded by NASA, which was a three year project. And we were studying caves in the Mojave Desert of Southern California and the Atacama Desert of Northern Chile. Now this particular video will be focused solely on these Mojave Desert work. Space researchers consider the most likely location for discovering potential primitive life forms on Mars to be in caves. But how do they find them? That was the goal of a recent NASA-funded airborne and ground study designed to aid in the detection of caves on the Earth, the Moon, and Mars. The purpose of the study is to learn how to detect caves on Earth and then apply the techniques that we develop for detecting caves on Earth to looking for caves on Mars. When a doctoral candidate at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff and a researcher at the SETI Institute flew two missions aboard a NASA King Air research aircraft in April 2011. The flights over lava fields in California's Mojave Desert collected both thermal and visual imagery to aid in detection of caves. We are basically coupling those ground-based measurements that we're currently collecting <coughs> with the thermal imaging data and the vis data that we're collecting as well. 
through developing techniques for detecting caves on Earth, we can then take those techniques and use them to look for caves on Mars. NASA Goddard engineer Mersey Shabala operated a NASA photo detector that imaged the temperature variations of the caves and surrounding surface that occur as a result of the heating effects of the sun. This thermal data will be compared with similar ground-based measurements. Wynn noted that there's a secondary reason for developing cave detection technology. Another important aspect of the study, as it relates to the importance of Martian caves, is that these caves could also serve as astronaut shelters. Wynn envisions this research will contribute to the development of selection criteria that could identify suitable cave targets for future robotic exploration. If life ever existed on Mars, we're going to find that evidence underground. So basically, using the work that and the information that we've gathered over the past 10 years and in consultation and discussions with a lot of uh, colleagues of mine, in particular Tim Titus of the USGS, who actually developed a portion of this schematic, we developed this idea for this program concept for planetary cave exploration. And with NASA, what they do is when they develop programs, they, they develop what is called a mission architecture. So what we did is we came up with uh, this mission architecture that could possibly at some point, hopefully in the very near future, uh, be the foundation for developing a planetary caves exploration program. And what uh, Dr. Titus had done here is he, uh, basically, he developed a mission architecture that went that addressed these three things here and upon thinking about it and further discussions with him and some others we kind of built this out to include uh, this fourth component here which is human outposts so actually taking it to that final step of having putting people in caves on mars so first let's look at this component of the mission architecture for this proposed program concept and as you saw from the video basically what we've been doing over the course of the past several years is furthering the techniques and technologies for looking for caves on earth and then once we figure out how to detect caves on earth we can then look for caves on other planets and a lot of that work has already been done there's been caves found on the moon there's been caves found on mars uh, uh, on pluto on titan on triton it's really fascinating work that's being done right now and uh, we're hoping that a lot of this work that we're done doing looking at caves on earth is going to factor into how they uh, evaluate caves on other planets so as I mentioned what we're doing is we're we're furthering these techniques for looking for caves on earth and as I mentioned earlier we've done work in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile on the big island of Hawaii uh, this picture here is me dangling from a rope uh, on this big vertical shaft, this big pit on the big island. And then of course, you, you recognize these images here. This is from the video that you, uh, this is uh, from the same mission that we flew that the video was based on uh, that we just watched. So when we first started this work in 2005, one of the very first questions that we had was how well does this technology work? So what we did is we took a thermal imaging camera and we decided to divide the 24 hour period of the day into four different parts pre dawn, midday, early evening, and late evening. And so, what I did was, I was the person elected to go out into the field and stand in front of these caves with this camera and take a picture. And that's what we did here. So, we took pictures of caves at four times over the 24 hour period. And as you can see here, these top two pictures is when you can actually see the cave. And that was because we took the, we took the pictures at the times when there was the greatest difference between the surface temperature and the entrance temperature. And that was early evening and early morning. As you can see here, during the hottest parts of the day, when the surface, the ground surface heats up, it's very hard, if not impossible, to see the cave entrance. So that was the first thing that we did. A couple of years, uh, actually several years later, 
uh, what we did was we then took this cam a different camera, went to the Mojave Desert in Southern California, and put the, the camera in front of the cave and programmed it to capture a picture every 10 minutes over an entire 24 hour period. And as you can see here in this video, what you're looking at is you're looking at the changes over time of how detectable this cave is. And you can see here over this 24 hour period that you can see, you can pretty much see the cave throughout that time period, which was, which was great information for us to use into figuring out what are the best conditions under which we can detect caves here on Earth? So then what we did is we took that imagery that from those two missions that we flew in, this, in the Mojave Desert of Southern California, and we did some really complicated math on these images. And I don't want to get into all of that because, well, it might make my head explode, and we do not want that to happen. But suffice it to say, here's what we did. We took the images from night and we took the daytime images. And that was part of the, what we used to analyze the, to look for caves, I guess, in, in the thermal. And then we added a new layer is we subtracted the day image from the night image to create another layer. So we had all of these different types of data that we did, then were going to analyze. Then we did something even more complex. We used these different math equations that we applied to the imagery to create these different types of data that we were then going to analyze. And there's a lot of math involved in this. Uh, I, fortunately, we did not have to do the, write the math out longhand in a notebook. We let the computer do most of the heavy lifting for us. It did all the work, but it generated these different types of images or data sets that we were then able to analyze. And as you're probably figuring out based on this, this very brief example, math and science go hand in hand. So it is very important if you want to be a scientist that you really need to be good in math because that, that is something that's going to help you down the road. So these are our results, or part of our results. What we did is we then took, we then extracted all the useful information out of that, that all of those different types of equations and analysis that we ran, very crazy and complex, and we generated this three-dimensional layer to where we were able to apply the, the, the information of interest into this composite image. And what you can see here is you see these green lines these are where the caves are known to occur. Obviously, they occur at the base of those lines. And then these red spikes here were what the computer predicted to be caves. And this was really neat because what we saw here is we saw a lot of agreement between the known caves and the predicted caves. So that told us that our math and our analysis was solid, that we were doing, that we were, that we were getting the result that we wanted, which doesn't happen that often, a lot in science, and we're really excited when it does. What you can see here in this blue circle, you see this red spike here. This is a predicted cave, but we're not, it was not a confirmed cave. So what we will be doing in the near future, perhaps in the spring, we'll be going out to some of these places that were predicted to be caves and get boots on the ground and go out there and see if they're actually caves. And that's really going to help us advance this uh, cave detection of Earth techniques even further, which will be even more informative for us to be able to look for caves on other planets. So we've, we've looked at how to detect caves on Earth, uh, how the, that could be applicable to uh, looking for caves on other planets. So now let's look at the candidate selection. So once we figured out the math and, and the processes, processes that we would be applying to look for caves on, on other planets, we can then start that and we are able to identify those caves that we believe to be of interest. We then have to narrow that, that number of caves down to a candidate set. So we would then be identifying those caves that we would believe to be candidate sites for robotic selection and for potentially 
human outposts. So that's step two in this mission architecture. So looking for caves on other planets, in particular, looking for caves on Mars. Well, this is some work that we had published in 2007. This was the discovery paper revealing the first seven caves on the, Mar on the red planet, on Mars. And you can see here that they have uh, names, and these were named after the uh, lead author and the second author's nieces and aunts. Uh, as you can see here, it'd be pretty cool to have a cave on another planet named after you, and all of these folks do. Janine, Nikki, Abby, they all have caves named after them on Mars. So how did we know that they were caves or likely to be caves? Well, what we did is we took images from the Mars Odyssey spacecraft that is currently orbiting Mars. It's actually the, it's the spacecraft that has been in operation the longest on Mars, which is really pretty neat. Uh, so what we can see here is this first image, image A, is just a, it's a picture. It's just a visual spectrum image. It's just like, you know, we were to take a black and white image using our, our smartphone. And what we have here in image B was a thermal image that was captured at three o'clock in the afternoon. And what we found really interesting here is it's really hard to see this cave entrance. And that's because we have near thermal equilibrium with the entrance of this, of this vertical pit and the surrounding surface material. So it's very hard. And if we were just to look at this, not having this image, we might, we would probably completely miss it because we wouldn't think that that would be something of interest in terms of it possibly being a cave. We then looked at the image that was captured at four o'clock in the morning. And lo and behold, and as we would expect, and as you saw from the earth images of Indian Cave in Northern Arizona, that this lit up like a Christmas tree. And that told us that if we were to capture images of the surface of Mars, Mars in the thermal infrared, we would want to do so in the early morning before the sun hits the surface of Mars and heats it up. Fast forward several years, and the, uh, this is a high-rise image from MRO, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is another spacecraft orbiting Mars, and we were able to get a 30 centimeter resolution of one of these cave entrances. Well, actually of all these cave entrances, this is one featured here. And this is amazing. It's 100 meters or 300 feet wide. Massive, massive feature on the, on the surface of Mars. And it is so big that you could actually fit a soccer field into the entrance. This is our, these are the seven sisters. Once again, you can see the visual images and these are, uh, you know, as close up as we could zoom in when we were clipping them from the, the images themselves. And what I would like to emphasize with this particular slide is that today, researchers at the U.S. Geological Survey that, that are friends and colleagues of mine have identified over 1,200 pits and caves on the surface of Mars. And right now, they are applying a selection criteria to identify those, those caves from that 1,200 that are going to be the best candidates for exploration in the future. So now let's turn our attention to robotic exploration. Now, when we're thinking about robotic exploration of caves on Mars, there's two ways of looking at this, two ways to crack this nut, if you will. One would be just to look at the entrance, to send a rover to simply look at the entrance. And we might want to examine the entrance and maybe, you know, 10 centimeters or so into the entrance so we can evaluate it as a potential uh, shelter for humans or perhaps a storage facility that we could then set up for, you know, storing equipment that we would need to live on Mars. Alternatively, we might want to go deep into the cave. And if we were going deep into the cave, the purpose of that would be to look for evidence of life. This is an image of one of the earlier generations of the world's first rock climbing robot. Its name is Lemur. And if you want to see some videos on Lemur, you can go to YouTube and Google 
Uh, Lima Robotics, you might have to add JPL, but maybe not. Haven't done it myself, but I suspect you'll be able to find some videos fairly easily. And this is us, a team of JPL researchers and myself in the Mojave Desert back in 2011. Or, my bad, it was 2014. And, uh, and what you can see here is you can see that I am belaying the robot. And what that means is I have a harness on here, and I have, and we have the rope, and basically I am watching the robot as it climbs and keeping this rope taunt to where if the ro rover does slip off of the rock, that it doesn't crash down to the ground, that it just dangles here. And there's actually one occasion where it did pop off the wall, and I had to jump up and reach out my hand and stop it because I was afraid that it was going to swing into the wall on the other side and uh, that that probably would have damaged the robot significantly. So we wanted to make sure that the robot was safe so we could continue our experiments. And this is Dr. Aaron Parness with JPL and he is the designer, he is the engineer that has designed Lemur. And one of the things that I'd like to point out about Lemur, and unfortunately I don't have an image here, but you can see all these all these toes on the on each leg and these have spikes on them and those spikes enable the the robot to grip as it's climbing across the rock surface well that was the rover in 2014 this is what lemur looks like today you can see that lemur is souped up and what lemur now has on it is lemur has uh, three different instruments for navigation and looking for evidence of life and with all of this additional robotics and it being built out even more and it has more computer equipment on board there is now artificial intelligence built into the robot and the robot can now climb across uh, it's up to what is it five meters now that the rover can climb and making decisions on its own using we have there's two cameras on board and the camera if I'm not mistaken is right here and it is looking as it's climbing and what it is doing is it is making decisions about where to place its feet how to grip and how to traverse the cave wall or cave ceiling and I just wanted to add here that we have submitted a, a big proposal for NASA. It's currently being reviewed by NASA. And if the proposal is successful, among many other things, we're going to do more cave detection. We're going to do more aircraft flights to uh, collect imagery of, of the surface so we can better detect caves. And we're also going to be advancing the technology of lemur so lemur can get closer to the point where we can send it to Mars to look for evidence of life. And the reason I wanted to discuss the feet and the toes on lemur was because of this. Last year, the, uh, an iteration, a version of lemur was sent to the International Space Station. And you can see this is an artist's concept here of the lemur. And instead of having those claws, those spines on each individual toe, it actually has this gecko gripper technology. So it is able to, much like we see the lizard, the gecko, and how it can walk on glass or how it can walk along walls, they use the same concepts. They basically biomimicked the, the toe technology and have been able to apply it to this robot. And basically what you're looking at here is you're looking at the actual R2-D2. We're hoping that at some point that we will be able to uh, use a lemur of this of this variety. If we have, if there's any breaches or problems on the on the exter the exterior of the spacecraft, we could send out a robot like this, and basically it would walk along the exterior of the spacecraft, inspect it, be able to send video back to the astronauts inside, and we would be able to assess the problems and possibly even saw, repair them using this type of robot. So now let's look at the final aspect of this mission architecture, this notion of human outposts. 
in particular inflatable pods. But first, I think we need to address this, and th this is something that is really exciting. Uh, Elon Musk, the president of S SpaceX, which is the, it's a private spacefaring company, which is basically sending, uh, they're, they're sending all the resupplies to the International Space Station. They're responsible for resupplying the International Space Station. And within the near future, they're going to be ferrying astronauts back and forth. On the 26th of September of this year, Elon Musk made this big announcement that he plans to send a cargo ship to Mars by 2022. That's just five years away. And the purpose of that cargo ship is that cargo ship is going to be sent there so that when the astronauts arrive, according to Elon Musk, in 2024, just seven years away, that there will already be supplies awaiting the new colonists. Now, what you can see here is this is an artist concept of what Elon Musk envisions the first Martian colony to look like, because that is why he's doing this. He wants to have the first humans on Mars by 2024, and then they start building something that looks like this. Well, this is really neat, and I always get excited looking at pictures like this, these artist concepts. I think about the reality of Mars, and Mars is a really harsh place. It's a very difficult place for humans and life to exist, especially on the surface. And this is why. This is an, this is an artist's concept of what galactic cosmic radiation could do or does. Fortunately, it doesn't do that to Earth, and that's because Earth has an atmosphere and a magnetosphere. And because of those things, it basically creates this protective force field from galactic cosmic radiation, and that enables life on Earth. If we did not have that, basically the entire surface of Earth would be sterilized. It would be blasted with cosmic radiation. Cosmic radiation also causes cancer. So as we can see here, cosmic radiation and humans, they don't mix. They don't get along well. Also, there are incredibly intense dust storms on the surface of Mars. Here's an example here of an image, and you can see this is hundreds of miles across. And at least twice a, year, a decade, Mars is engulfed in a massive, the entire planet of Mars is engulfed in, in a massive dust storm. Not a good place to live. Also, it's very important to note, that the temperatures on Mars are incredibly cold. The average global temperature of Mars is minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 62 degrees Celsius. The equator, once humans go to Mars, that's where we're going to want to be because during the summer, it's actually 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius during the day. And at night, it dips down to minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit are minus 73 degrees Celsius. So you can see this, this notion of setting up a colony on the surface of Mars, there's gonna be a lot of problems and challenges associated with that. That's why we've been thinking about something like this, a colony of cavemen and cave women. This is the safest place for humans to be on Mars. One, the temperatures are much milder underground because they're insulated and they're and they're and for example the average annual surface temperature of a cave well let me rephrase that the interior of a cave reflects the annual average surface temperature of the surface so for example during a cold winter night the inside of the cave is going to be much warmer and with the inside of the cave being much warmer, it's going to be cozy. That's where we're going to want to be. Also, we've calculated that the, the roof material of a cave only has to be about 60 feet thick or 20 meters thick to be able to shield the inhabitants of that cave from cosmic radiation. Also, as you would expect, inside a cave, you're not going to have to be dealing with dust. 
So this is a nice place to set up camp. This is where we're going to want to be. This is an artist concept of what a colleague of mine has been working on for the past several years. This is a, an, an inflatable habitat pod designed by Dr. Pablo de Leon of University of North Dakota. And the idea here is that once we get to the point where we're going to send humans to Mars, and once we've already identified those caves that we're going to want to live in, we could insert something like this into the cave, inflate it, and bada boom, bada bing, we have a place to live. So these are the ideas that we're putting forth here. These inflatable habitat pods are going to be much better than trying to live on the harsh Martian surface. So the last aspect of this ability for humans to live underground on Mars are these speleo suits and related equipment. And this is what we envision one day, hopefully in the near future, that we will be designing and testing both suits that are designed to withstand the rigors of working underground. They have to be rip resistant. These Michelin man type spacesuits here that are big and bulky are not going to work well underground. We need something like this, kind of like a body suit, something that's, that's, that fits really close to the body, but at the same time enables us to be able to move well because you have to be agile. We might have to do something like this. We might have to be able, we, we might need to rappel into a pit or climb out of a hole or climb up a wall. And I've been, over the past five years, I've been speaking with both Pablo de Leon at the University of North Dakota. And actually last year, I went to Johnson Space Center and met with the same engineers that designed the tools that are used on the International Space Station. And we're designing a project, a project proposal that we're going to submit to address some of these issues. We want to design spacesuits and related equipment that will enable us to work on Mars underground. And this is what I hope to see within my lifetime. I hope one day, while I'm still on this earth, that we will be able to see not artist concepts like this, but actually pictures of researchers working and living underground on Mars. And with that, a humongous thank you. Thank you all so much. And here's my contact information. So if your instructors would like to get in touch with me, if you guys have additional questions come up after our, our Q&A session at, uh, that's about to take place, you all can, uh, your teachers can contact me. You can also look me up on the internet. Here's my web address here. And then I'm on Instagram and Twitter also. So I'm all over social media, so I'm easy to find. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for that. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, as you said, we're going to go into Q&A now. And all right. Miss Essence class, we're going to start with you guys for a couple of questions, actually. So if you guys want to come up and uh, go right ahead. Yeah, you're good. Hi. Hi. Hey. So, um, how long have you been a scientist? Actually, looking back on it, I think I've been a scientist ever since I was your age. I have always been curious. Ever since I was a little boy, I was always curious about, about nature, about how things worked. And I think that went from being a curious boy to becoming a curious scientist. So it was something that really blossomed in me at a very young age. Uh, but in terms of being an actual scientist, uh, I would say the past 15 years, I've been, I've been a scientist for over 15 years now. Excellent. It's always nice when that question gets asked. Uh, all right. If the same student or a different student, Miss Essence class, wants to ask a question. I know you guys are short on time, so come on up and uh, go for it. Hi, my name is Maria. What do you see in the caves? Could you repeat that, Maria? What do you see in the caves? What do we see in the caves? 
Well, you know, for me, that is one of the most exciting things about working underground because you never know what you're going to see. And you can go to the same cave multiple times and you always stand the chance of seeing something different. So let's see, what have I seen in caves? Uh, I've seen javelina, which are the, the pigs that live here that are, that are native to the southwestern U.S. I've seen a lot of bats. I've seen bugs, a lot of bugs. I study bugs as well. Uh, one time while working in a cave in Belize, we saw footy prints of a jaguar. So we didn't actually see the jaguar, but we saw the footprints of the jaguar. Uh, so yeah, like I said, it's, it's always an adventure when you're working underground because you never know what you're going to see. You can always, you, you'll always see something different. And then in addition to wildlife and, and insects, uh, you can see just amazing formations. The, the, the rock formations that you see, they're called speleothems. <laughs> I've seen blind catfish that are living in these crystal clear pools underground and, and just all sorts of different things. It's just, it's, it's an amazing world. And truly, it's one of the last frontiers of exploration on this planet is deep underground. Excellent. What a great answer. Uh, all right. Uh, Miss Kentrell's class, if you guys have a question. <clears throat> So many questions. Okay, well, we have to start with one. <laughs> That's great. Uh, why did you pick to um, Adventure Caves? That's a really good question. Um, I started studying caves because I really liked bats. And I knew that I wanted to study bats. And I didn't decide upon studying caves specifically, but I knew I wanted to study bats. And then we know that bats live in caves and it all just came together. And I wound up studying bats that lived in caves. And over time, uh, I became interested in being able to find caves on earth to find where the bats live so we could help the bats, so we could protect those caves. And that turned into this, looking for caves on other planets. What a neat career trajectory, not very uh, common. Love it. Yeah, it's kind of like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Miss Bifford's class, you guys switched cameras, and the only thing is, is I can't demute your mic now. So you can ask a question. Hopefully the mic's working now. But you'll just have to go to the top of your screen and, and press the little microphone symbol to do that. There you go. Does it work? How did you make? Whoa. How did you make? Whoa! So that was cool. That was cool. It was like we were in a cave, <laughs> Miss Bever. Like we can hear you, but there was this epic reverberation that sort of drowned out everything. So let's see if we, it's we still should around. have had that going on in the background of my talk because it. Yeah, we should. Very... We're gonna we're gonna record that and put it for the next talk. So Miss Bever. Try and type in the question. I, I'll come back and we'll check your mic in a little bit and see if it works, but you can type it in. Uh, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, we'll go to Miss Kaiser's class. So if you guys have a question, come on up. Okay. Um, will Mars be able to support life other than humans? And if it does, like, how will, like, what do you use? What stuff will you have to help do that? That was great. Did you guys rehearse that? That was great how you kind of had one question that then built off of the other. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so, so what sort of life does Mars, could Mars support? Um, well, we know that, that shortly after the formation of Mars, that Mars was much like Earth. We, we refer to it as our sister planet. We believe there were shallow seas. We believe that Mars, that, that, that evidence strongly suggests that there, was, there, were, there were seas, there was an atmosphere, that life could have once existed on Mars. What is interesting is that we see that Mars has undergone this dramatic shift. It's now very different. It's now this, this desert-like planet. So what 
NASA and other space agencies have been doing is they've been probing into, well, actually right now it's just NASA, has been probing into the ground to look for evidence of life, which tells us something, right? It's, and I mentioned earlier, cosmic radiation and life doesn't mix. So surface of Mars, not a very good place. So where are we gonna to wanna to look? We wanna to wanna to look in the ground. And then where would be a really good place to look? Even further in the ground. So that's what we're after. In other words, we wanna look in caves. So to be specific, what types of life could exist, um, even though it would be incredibly awesome if there were Martian bats, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, but most likely what we would be looking at is microbial life. If it still exists on Mars, that's what we're going to see. We're going to, if once we are able to look deep into caves, we might find evidence of either existing microbial life or extinct microbial life. Excellent. All right. Uh, at risk of, you know, making everyone deaf with reverberation, if you want to try again, Miss Bifford, I know you've been playing with a computer. Let's see. And then if not, I have your written in question that I can pass along. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Yay. This is Brody. He has a question. How did you hey, make Brody. How did you make sure it was safe to go down the volcano pit in Hawaii? Okay, that one was was pretty easy. Uh those are those are big, they're called pit craters. So they're these big pits that were basically well, they're the result of volcanic activity. But the volcanic activity is no longer in that area, so they're safe to enter from that perspective. Um, so we didn't have to think about, you know, do we need respirators uh, to protect us so we can breathe? Do we need to wear special suits because it's really hot and we don't want to get lava on us because that would hurt? Uh, so we, we don't have to do that. Uh, but what we did learn, which was pretty interesting, and, and I'd have to say, you know, for a guy that also studies bugs, I, I was not the guy that found the big the big colony of bees, but uh, my, my colleague, the, the guy that was in charge of the project, as he was rappelling into one of the pits, he noticed a big beehive on the wall and he stopped for a second to look at it and that proved to be a bad idea because the bees got mad and went after him. So that was one thing that we learned when we were, we were rappelling along those walls is that we had to be very careful and we had to think about where we're placing our feet and we also learned from his experience that if you saw what looked like uh, a beehive, to move fast past it so you don't get stung. Because he got stung like 10 times. <laughs> Sorry, Schadenfreude. Uh, all right, uh, great. Yeah, uh, glad it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> all right, let's go back to Mrs. Cantrell's class if you guys have another question. I mean, you have 100 questions, obviously. Oh. So good news is, by the way, so we're going to have a student come up and ask in a second, but Judd did pass along his email address at the end of his presentation, so if you have lots of questions after, you can send questions. And if he's not exactly. repelling into Hawaiian caves, he'll answer them. Okay, hands down. Yes, I was. Okay, I'm like nice and loud. Um, so have you seen any fossils in the caves? Ooh, cool question, fossils. Uh, yes, we have. Um, well, okay, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question, and we're going to go from recently dead to really, really, really dead. So recently dead, what we will occasionally find in caves are animals that get lost, and they wander into the cave, and they can't get out. And they will decompose in the cave, and that provides food for the, the, the bugs that live in the cave, right? So we've seen that. I've found jackrabbits in caves. I've found mice and rats in caves. Uh, and then as we go to even more dead, uh, up on North Rim Grand Canyon in two different caves, we found mummies of bats. So they were actually dried out and they, they were like really, really, really dead. They've been there for a long time. But in terms of fossils, now going to the, you know, like I was saying, we have, we have recently dead and then we have really, really, really dead that's like way over here dead. So we're going over here now. And for those animals, we found, we found evidence of sheep that, that were in the caves. And uh, we actually found sheep bones and sheep teeth. And, the, and this was up on North Rim Grand Canyon also. And those, and those sheep have actually, 
they're, they're now extinct in the area. So this was, we believe it to be from around the Pleistocene, from the Ice Age. Uh, also up on North Rim, Grand Canyon, or actually in Grand Canyon proper, there's actually a couple of caves that the floor is covered with ground sloth dung. So if you look up ground sloth, if you search that, you'll see that there are these once these massive animals that were, they didn't climb in trees like the sloths that we know of today. They were ground sloths for a reason. They walked around on the ground. And we see the poo from them all over the cave. I like, what I love about exploring by the seat of your pants is you can start out with a hangout about Martian caves and end up with bat mummies, which we need to do a Halloween episode for next year for sure. So <laughs> yeah, that would be bat awesome. Thing. We're going to get you back for that. Uh, Miss Kaiser's class. Are you guys still in school? Like is school? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, we'll go back to uh, Miss Difford's class then. If you guys have a second question, I can actually demute you this time. So if you have a second question. Look at Scott. Look at Ready? How do you know volcanoes are not active? There's not red stuff at the bottom of it. <laughs> no, nah, seriously. Um, well, we, we would know that a volcano is not active. And that's a really good question, though. I, I, I was kind of being a smart aleck in the answer. Um, there, there's a number of ways. Uh, one, we know that you know, really, really old volcanoes in terms of uh, in the way we define really old volcanoes. Uh, let, I'll just give a brief tectonics lesson. So when, so when we see, when we look at the Earth, we know that the Earth is comprised of all these plates. And we call that plate tectonics. And what happens is when these plates move along those contact points, that's where we see the, the active volcanic, ac volcanic activity right here along the scene. And what can happen is, is when, you, when you're directly over one of those plates and there are volcanoes present, that's when you will have an active volcano. And what will happen over time is that these plates shift and so, do, and so does the, earth, the surface part of the earth. And what can happen is, is you will shift off of an active plate. And what we're seeing in the Hawaiian Islands is a wonderful example for that. Because when you look at the Hawaiian Islands, if you look up in the, what is it? Yeah, the northwesternmost corner of the islands, those are all extinct. They have volcanoes, but they're all extinct because they've, they've slipped off of that plate. And then if you look in the southeastern corner, where the Big Island of Hawaii is, that's where all the active volcanoes are because Big Island is still right, centered right over that active plate. And in several million years, maybe tens of million years, I'm sure we, we've calculated that, but I don't know offhand exactly what that the time frame is. Big Island will then shift off of that plate and then there will be extinct volcanoes on Big Island. And then, and then all of a sudden, a new island will start to form. Uh, all right. We're going, this has been so good that I haven't even realized you've gone quite long. So what I'll do is we'll have one last question uh, out of the right. hundreds of students in Miss Cantrell's class. So. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> the more you jump, the more likely you already picked. What did you name your first Insect in your last insect that you found. Ooh, ooh. Uh, let's see. What did the first insect that we named collectively was uh, named after a good friend of mine. His name is, uh, last name is Voiles. His name is Kyle Voiles. And he was working with me up on North Rim Grand Canyon. And we named this cave adapted millipede after him. And let's see the last one that we named. It is, and, and this is cool. It's called not, it's, it's a type of springtail. And springtails are these little tiny white insects. They're, you know, you can see my fingers are very pinched close together and they would kind of be like this big. If you think about a grain of rice, it's like a quarter of the length of a grain of rice. And we named one from uh, a earth crack in northern Arizona that we found deep in the earth crack. We named it Nashavak, which is from the Hopi language, and which is a, a Native American tribe here in northern Arizona. 
And so we used that, we used their language to name this animal because the Hopi people believe those earth cracks are sacred. So to honor them and to honor the culture, we named it using a Hopi phrase, and that means in the middle. And the reason why we called it in the middle was because the species was between these, the, uh, between two different genera or two different genuses. It's not technically correct science, it's uh, lingo, but genera is the plural of genus. So it was in between two genera. Kind of complex, but that's what we named it. I can't believe you had an answer, much less such a good one for that. So thank you so much. And we can leave it off there. What we do at the end of every hangout is I'm going to demute the microphones of both Ms. Cantrell's and Mrs. Bifford's class. If you guys can join me in saying a huge thank you to Judd. So thank you so much for joining us, Judd. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Science is awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> Great questions, guys. Great hangout. Judd, thank you so much for joining us again. Thank you, Jesse. Thanks for having me. All right. And we'll have you back for that bat, bat mummy thing. We're going to make that happen, okay? I'm, I'm excited. Excellent. All right. And for all the classes that have more questions, again, he, he passed along all his, his email address and everything else at the end, so you guys can check that out after. Uh, if any of you are joining us for the rest of Space Week, we look forward to having you back. And if you took some really excited pictures today at the Hangout, use hashtag ExploreSpace, and you can win some cool prizes at the end of the week. So until then, guys, have a